And, and Lorraine, where's Lorraine? She's still here. Uh, we'd like you to come out and pick two ladies to uh, be on your team. And uh, there's a chocolate Easter egg for the ones who win. So uh, pick a couple of guys to come out. Yes, yeah, that's... Biblically literate, aren't they? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Biblically literate, yeah. Biblically literate. It's going to be hard. Yep, I reckon I've got the first one, Paul. Paul's coming out, OK. Well, it's like, like Who, picking up a team, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> don't get offended if you don't get picked. No. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, who, who have you got? Um, I'd like Lynn on my team, thank you. Lynn, OK, yes. Yeah. And one other? Three all together? Um, Topsy, thank you. <laughs> come on, Topsy, you're being chosen. Uh, I've got Jack. Can Jack come forward, please? Oh, that's cheating, getting an ex-minister to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could have had Alan. Yeah, could have had Mavis. Oh, no, Mavis would have gone on the ladies' team. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, what teams we've got? And... Um, Marge, I'd like you to keep the score for me, if you, if you would. <laughs> now, the first question is, the tomb was sealed. And this is to you, ladies. We'll put it to you first. Who sealed the tomb? Was it Joseph, Herod, the high priest, or the soldiers? That's a tricky one. Now you've just lost the answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Okay, well, what are, your answer is? The soldiers. Bing, wrong. Okay. Um, who was it? It narrows it down a little bit. It wasn't the soldiers. Go on, you're getting close. Go, go for it, go for it, go for it. Oh, time, time's getting, go on. Which one? Joseph is right, one of the guys. Okay. Now, we'll start with the guys this time. Who were the first to witness the resurrection? Was it Peter, Thomas, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, or Salome? It's a trick question. Notice that it says who was and who were. Slash meaning could be either. Could be either, yeah. So we could have one answer or could have two. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your answer? Two Marys? I don't know. Ask Jerry. <laughs> Two Marys. <laughs> Two Marys. Ooh. Okay, we'll come back to you girls. I didn't get it right. <laughs> Which ones would you go for? <laughs> Going. Which one? Mary, the mother of Mary. Well, actually... Nobody got that one. It's Peter, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. Depends on which gospel you're reading. Okay. Well, okay, to you girls. Yeah. 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 You girls. The women went into the tomb. Did they see an angel? They saw two angels. They ran to get Peter. They saw the burial clothes. Which one's right? Those who are at the Bible study on Thursday know the answer to this. Hey. Well, which one? Everything. Everything except what? Ooh, everything except B. Let's, <laughs> Let's, let's try you guys out yeah. on it. Yeah. Get a phone, a friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Do you know the answer to this one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, your answer is they read Peter. Uh, Yes. Okay, that, that's the question. Nobody gets that one. That was all right except for D, right? <laughs> okay, all right except for D. Okay, well, let's try the next one. The story of Jesus, this is to you ladies, appears in all four Gospels, or appears in Matthew, appears in Mark, or appears in Luke. Right, Tomaeus. So your answer is? Luke! Luke, you got it right. Okay. Yay. Okay. Who said, unless I see the marks of the nails, I will not believe? It was a Peter, Matthew, Thomas, or Judas? Thomas, Thomas right. Good work, guys. Uh, what happened to Judas? This is back, back to you girls. What happened to Judas? He was punished by the Romans. He was banished from the disciple band. He committed suicide. But he died, or he died suddenly, but did not suicide. Which one? C. C. Which one? C. C. Both wrong. Okay. Because it depends on what you read. One says he committed suicide, and another, I think it's the Book of Acts, says he died suddenly, for no for no reason at all. So, uh, okay, we didn't know that one. <laughs> What's the score, Marge? Two to, two to the men, one to the lady. Okay, come on, come on, guys. Jesus' command to the early church was to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is found in what? Matthew, Mark, all four Gospels or the book of Acts? Okay, you ready to get 30 to 5? Your answer is? Ding, wrong. Okay, come over to you guys. No, we didn't even hear. What did you say? No, no, You're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. Oh, don't tell them, man. Okay, that's wrong too. <laughs> it's still wrong. <laughs> it's only found in the book of Acts. Yeah. So, two for the men, one for the ladies. The guys get the Easter eggs. Well done, guys. <laughs> 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 and I think at this stage we have our Bible ready. Thanks, Paul. Good morning, church. Hope I do better with this than what I just did with the questions. <laughs> uh, today's Bible reading is from Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live then you shall know that i am the lord 
So prophesied, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from your four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord and I have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Paul. It's uh, interesting when you're confronted by hopeless situations. Um, I sat up and watched the grand final last year to the very last siren. Swans Barracker, right? Swans Barracker. And there were about 12 goals down, but I watched to the end. And I watched it and it was absolutely hopeless. How loyal can you be? And um, as I, the si final siren went, I asked myself the question, can these bones live? Or when I think of uh, the political scene, and this is a non-political comment, um, the Liberal Party uh, lost the seat of Aston and uh, the influence of the Liberal Party became smaller and smaller. And I think, it, I think this is right. For the first time in history, uh, every state and territory is dominated by the Labor Party and they also dominate the federal scene as well. And if you're a Liberal voter, you'd be asking yourself the question, can these bones live? And what you're inclined to do as a Swan supporter is to think back to 2012 when they actually won a grand final. If you're a Liberal Party supporter, you'd be thinking back to the glory days of Bob Menzies and uh, perhaps John Howard and the early days of uh, whoever, I've forgotten his name. And we're, we're inclined to do that. We're inclined to go back in history and say, Things used to be good, but they're no longer. Can these bones live? Now, this reading that we heard, it was written in a time when Jerusalem was in bad trouble. Uh, Zedekiah the king had been carted off to Babylon, and so, so had so many others as well. The walls were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And things were very, very grim. It seems as if Israel had no future. And in those days comes Ezekiel and he says these words that we've heard and we'll hear again, hear again. The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the belly. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many lying in the belly and they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Lord, you know. Can these bones live? I think of an elderly couple who uh, lived on a little farming property, not very far from here. And uh, their church had been a great church. They'd had, uh, you know, they remember the days when the Sunday school platform was full for the Sunday school anniversary. Uh, they remember the days the church had a very, very strong future. And then they also remembered the days that the church started to come back as it ran out of money for this and for that and became smaller and smaller. And each catback that they made had a negative effect on the church because it, it if you like, decreased it, its witness. And then they found that the enthusiasm was down. 
And each Sunday they would go to church. They loved being with the people. As the church shrunk, it was, just became like a, a, a young family, or an old family actually, because these people were in their 70s and they were amongst the younger people in the church. And the ministers came and went and uh, gradually they went for old guys to be part-time or they got students and the church started to decline. And the family atmosphere was great, but it was discouraging for them. And uh, they continued to sing the old hymns like we did today. And uh, the coffee was the Maxwell House Catering Blend, which they buy a tin of it and it'll last a few weeks. And uh, they remember the days that the things were great when the minister got on his bike and ran around the, 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 uh, visiting everybody in the, sun, in, the, in the afternoon. On the way home, they'd express their discouragement. They loved the people but they didn't like what was happening to their church. And the volunteer aspect grew smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, their minister that they did have became seriously ill. And on their way home, they talked about the fact that their church had no hope. And rather than Sunday being a day of joy, it was a day that was very depressing. Can these bones live. Another story. A young man came to see me once uh, and he resigned from this, he resigned from public worship, he re resigned from the board and uh, I knew that there was something wrong the way that he was talking and he's turned out that his wife thought he was working long hours and he wasn't having working long hours at all, he was having a full-blown affair and as he talked, he talked about the, the dilemma he felt. Should he leave home? Should he go with the young woman uh, that uh, he'd be fallen in love with? Uh, what about his faith? What about uh, finances? What about his loyalty that he felt to his wife? What about the children? Well, the flirtation that he was involved in created a horrible mess. And uh, he asked his friends, should he tell his wife? And he did. And she went into a tailspin and she made the comment, which actually sealed that aspect of their marriage, when she said, it's either her or it's either me. He just chose her. And uh, he lost friends, he lost status, his work output decreased and he was suddenly put on monthly uh, reviews and he knew he was in trouble. He became depressed. His finances suffered as well as he tried to maintain the house, his flat and his children as well. And he counted his lost. He lost his home, he lost his wife, he lost his family and he lost friends as well. And his new mate started to react to the fact that he was depressed. He started to act, uh, react to his moodiness. Everybody was unhappy. Can these bones live? Well, changing the story, there is Darren, whose uh, parents encouraged Darren at the age of 13 to 14 to sip a little bit of alcohol like they had every day. And uh, that was the beginning of his drinking. And every uh, Saturday he'd play footy for the local team and they had the Sunday get-together where they reviewed the game and then had a good drinking session as well. And the older players encouraged him to drink heavily. And suddenly he found he became a binge drinker. Now he was very careful. He made sure that he didn't drive and drink. But there was one day when the temptation was too much. He usually left his car at the pub and uh, walked home or got a taxi. But this day he was a bit uneasy and he felt he'd take, he'd take his car and of course he ran a red light and injured a lady in, a, in her car and her children as well. Found himself before the magistrate and the magistrate said that you'll be released on bail, bail but look out for a custodial sentence. He came to the minister, his mother attended church and he told the story. And it was a story of feeling absolutely destroyed. Can these bones live? And then we've got the, the story of an old lady. She was 95 
uh, and a widow, had been a widow for 14 years. And at the age of 90, she lost her licence. She had a minor accident and the family got on her back and said no more driving. And suddenly her world became so much smaller. And she suffered intensely from arthritis and uh, found that getting around was pretty hard. Her eyes began to go and her favourite uh, pastime of reading uh, started to decline as well. Her world was shrinking and she kept asking the family, what am I here for? What's my purpose? Well, they went into care and from care into a nursing home and all the possessions that she had were in a small cupboard in that small room and she was just waiting for death. And you look at a situation like that and you say, can these bones live? Then you come to the upper room, tiny room, and in that room there was a strong feeling of fear and disappointment. The disciples were hiding because they were frightened of ending up on a cross like Jesus did. And there was intense disappointment they thought that he was more than an untrained rabbi. They thought he was the Messiah. They said he told him that. They saw the miracles. They heard the teaching. And it was an amazing guy to be involved with. They saw him claim to be superior to Moses. And they enjoyed the fight with the Pharisees and the new way that he offered. And when they lived through the crucifixion, it was more than the loss of a leader. It was also the loss of a future. And Peter says, I'm going back fishing. And in that Jerusalem setting, they're nervous. They remember the fact that they had denied Christ. They remember they fled away from the scene of the crucifixion. And it seems as if things had come to a dead end. Can these bones live? Ezekiel. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and you will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bones to its bones. And I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and the skin had covered them and there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God from the four winds I breathe upon these slain that they might live. And I prophesied as he commanded me and the, the breath came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet fast multitude. That which was hopeless became alive because of the breath of a God. And you go back to the children of Israel and you discover that in the time of new leadership when Cyrus became the, the ruler of Babylon and overcome the Nebuchadnezzar who was there, he said you can go back to your homeland. And the second part of Isaiah, third part of Isaiah tells us of the fact that God would protect them as they returned to their homeland. And you know the story. The temple was rebuilt, the walls were rebuilt, the law was respected, and that which was hopeless became hopeful. And the prophets reflected on this. And they thought about the exile, they thought about the exodus, and they concluded that God is not a God of dead ends. God is a God of new beginnings. And he will restore his nation to greatness again. Can these bones live? Sure can. What about that elderly couple going to church? There came a day when the church decided that it had enough and they had a, a business meeting. And uh, amazingly, they started to talk about selling and starting again. And uh, when they were about to turn, take the vote, one of the leadership group turned to this elderly couple because this elderly couple were the matriarchs and patriarchs of the church. Do you agree? that we should sell and start again. And they said, yes. And that vote was worth 20 votes. And from that point on, as they sold, rebuilt, with a new vision, a new hope, 
the church began to grow in a new area. And as it grew, they discovered that new families started to arrive. And that church, which was elderly, suddenly became full of young families. This story reminds me a lot of church history. And as you look at church history, there are many times when people have said, can these bones live? The church is dead. And even when you go back to the first century and the church was being strongly persecuted, people said the church has had it. And in the fourth century when they divided over theology, people said the church had had it. In the 11th century when there were two popes, people said, oh, the church has had it. And in the time of the 16th century, the time of the Martin Luther and Judge Kelvin and all those, they said the church is divided again. It's hopeless. 18th and 19th century, the time of the Enlightenment, people said church has had it. So beginning at the end of the 19th century, sorry, the end of the uh, 18th century, uh, right throughout the 18th century and 19th century with the birth of communism, Marx and Lenin's influence, people said the church is just there to support the masses in their misery. The church has had it. 1920s, the market mon monkey trial in the United States in the state of Tennessee, of all places, uh, as people debated the theories of evolution, people said the church has had it. As they do their surveys today and they discover that the church is in decline and uh, less people are attending, people said the church has had it. But it seems to me when you look at the history of the church, when you look at the history of this little church that was saved and restored to its full potential, you start to see that there is something in the church that keeps it going. And it is the very spirit of the living Christ. Can these bones live? Sure can. What about that guy with the sick marriage? Well, here he is in his misery. Life is tough. He's losing in every way. And eventually, like the prodigal son, he comes to his senses and goes back to his wife and said, will you take me back? Now, by then, she had settled into a new routine. She'd settled the children into a new routine. She'd been to Centrelink and everything was working for her. And suddenly a man that she didn't trust comes into her life again and says, will you take me back? A lot of counselling, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of possibilities, a lot of, if you like, interviews with ministry. And when we interviewed this couple in church, I remember this, I don't know if you remember this, Marge, the interview went on and on and on. It was so moving because they gave everything. They gave everything they told of their failures and all that type of thing. And she even recognised the fact that she was partly responsible for him leaving. And as they talked, they talked about the spirit of the living God restoring their marriage. And they acknowledged that. And I remember the uh, young associate we had said to me during the interview, don't stop. Well, forget about my sermon, he said. This is a sermon within itself. And we heard the exciting story of a couple whose marriage had been restored. Can these bones live? Well, what about our drinking guy? Well, he was full of remorse. He was remorse for the fact that not only had he lost his licence, not only was he facing a custodial sentence, but also the fact that he had if you like, let himself down, let his morals down. And uh, he went to AA, he attended sessions, sessions with the psychiatrist and he got a custodial sentence, all right, six months in a prison farm. And he returned and when he got out, he came to see the minister, expressed his remorse, understood the power of forgiveness and started again, became a Christian. And you ask yourself the question, can these bones live? Sure can. And then you've got this elderly lady in the nursing home. Early one morning, the nurse brings her in a cup of tea and suddenly realises that the cup of tea will not be used. She's lying still in the bed, breath gone from her. And her suffering was over at that point. But was it? She knew a fellowship with God and suddenly in that small room that she was confined to, she suddenly entered a bigger space, a bigger space where she knew the fellowship of God and she discovered that God was there even at this turning point. 
and the small world had suddenly become so much larger. And you ask yourself the question, can these bones live? Sure can. So what about the disciples? The woman was not believable. That's the way they thought. So they checked it out according to the Gospels. And from that point on, there was a sudden transformation happened with these guys. Suddenly they became alive. Suddenly their fear was gone. Suddenly they, instead of being quiet, they became spoke, vocal. Instead of being confined to Jerusalem, they were confined to the entire world. And they were prepared to give their lives for the sake of the risen Christ. And their, like their discovery of the empty tomb not only had a personal implication, but had global implications as well. And you look at this and you see the exciting story where there's defeat, despair and a limited future and the risen Christ opened up new possibilities. Can these bones live? Sure can. And we are here today because of the resurrection of Christ. If it all stopped there, we wouldn't even be bothering to meet. The spirit of the living Christ brings hope New horizons, vitality to people, to marriages, to churches, to old ladies. When we see dead bones, we see defeated people. And if they discover that Christ has risen from the dead, they can experience that new vitality and these dead bones can live. And we come to communion. And we celebrate the fact that we are here in the midst of the risen Christ. Marge and I spent a lot of time in the Philippines. Each year we go over for two or three weeks. And one year we went over and arrived on All Saints Day, which is a big mistake because nothing happens in the Philippines, I think in Spain as well, on All Saints Day. Everybody goes to the cemetery. And there are traffic jams around the cemetery. And they sit there and they eat and they drink and they remember the dead, All Saints Day. And if you like, they celebrate family, they celebrate life in the midst of someone who has died. That person is in the grave, six feet under. When it comes to communion, we're not celebrating someone who is dead, but we are celebrating the presence of the living Christ and as we went through those stories, we discovered that there's new vitality, new hope, new direction, new life. And as we take bread and the bread and the cup, we invite all of us. Sometimes we feel hopeless. Sometimes we feel tad, sad. Sometimes we feel defeated. But as we take the bread and the cup, we're reminded that we are in the presence of the living Christ. And it's a wonderful experience. Can these bones live? Sure can. He breathed on them and they became alive. And as we take communion, we're going to pray that God would breathe on upon us, overcome our tiredness, overcome our pessimism and appreciate that we are in the presence of the living Christ. Let's pray together. God our Father, we thank you that as we share this bread and cup, we share with you who is in our midst which brings light, vitality, hope and a new direction. Renew us all as we take the bread and the wine. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Come, celebrate the presence of the living Christ.